welcome to the Wednesday night service. Praise God. Ain't it great to be in the house of God tonight? Me and my beautiful wife was talking here the other night about blessings. And, uh, and I told her a uh, time when I kept praying to God, God bless my finances so I can buy more groceries and stuff like that. And Well, that afternoon I had a call from uh, my mom and said, hey, I cleaned out my cabinets. You want some food? And I said, yeah, I guess. And never even dawned on me that I even prayed that prayer. So I went and picked it up, and the next morning I was sitting there praying to God, God, bless my finances, buy some food. And I stopped dead in my tracks right there. And I said, wait a minute, God's already blessed me. He already answered that. So I started thanking him for the blessings. So you know, if we got our eyes open, we can see God's blessings every day. And, you know, it's really important because we keep praying the same thing that he's already blessed you in one way or another. It may not be blessing you in the finances, even though I need food. So he blessed me with someone giving me food and not the money to buy the food. So uh, in Deuteronomy 28, 2 and 3, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee. If, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shalt thou be in the field. So I want to take this time and I just want to pray and thank God for the blessings we've, we've received and we have not thanked him for. In the glorious name of Jesus, I pray, Lord God, thank you for every blessing that you have given to us by opening our eyes every morning, the breath we take, be able to get out of bed and walk, Lord God. These are blessings every day that you give us, Lord God, putting food on our table, money in our accounts, Lord God, to help others, Lord God, financially, or you know each and every need, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord God, let your Holy Spirit be upon each and every person in this place, Lord God. I pray that your blessing and anointing be upon pastor as he brings the word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.
sincere worshiper is that their heart would be clean before God scripture says who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord who shall stand in his holy place he that hath clean hands and pure heart hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity there is a great temptation that each of us have to fight daily and that is the temptation to let our soul be lifted up towards vanity I know the context of that verse is speaking of idols that uh, Israel was always dealing with. But there are idols in our world, maybe not statues of some kind or various things such as that, but things that our soul can be drawn away. We think, well, if I had more of this, that, or the other, if only I was connected with this person or that person even, that I would discover what I'm missing in my life. I and you are not missing anything in our life when Jesus is the center of our life, when he's the Lord of our life. If there is anything else that we feel like we need in conjunction with him that we've called Lord, that, my friend, is a vain thing, and our soul gets lifted up to vanity. I wonder if we ought to sing this song again one more time and just allow this, the, what I've just shared from the scripture to really cause us to focus. Am I seeking vain things in any way, shape, or form? Let's, let's make it a prayer, can we? Create in me, Create in me a clean, clean heart and purify me from every vain purify thing. Oh, create in me a clean heart so that I, so that I may worship, worship thee. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Create in me a clean, a clean heart and purify, purify me, God, from purify every false thing. Everything create that's not like you, Lord Jesus. Not only is the Christian tempted by that which could be vain, but our world obviously is forever seeking vanity. The Bible speaks of vanity, which brings vexation of spirit. We need to pray tonight, amen, for our nation. We need to pray for the influence of our nation upon the rest of the world, that God would be glorified in these United States of America. In, in a way that he's never been before, that we could truly be that city that sits upon a hill. And there's so many distractions, so many things happening in our present society that is easily uh, able to draw us away from a single focus upon the Lord. If we're not careful, we can get caught up in what they call doomsday scrolling, and that is just forever scrolling on Facebook or on your phone, and one news feed after the other, and, and uh, you can get addicted to that, just wanting to know the news and wanting to be aware of what's happening. Friend, you and I need to keep a single heart and a single focus. 
And we need, we need God to be glorified in this nation. I want us to pray tonight. And if you have a special need, this would be a time for you to lift up that need before God as well. And uh, I know that uh, Austin Sprouse is watching tonight. Maybe even a, a James is watching. Someone I've been talking to. Uh, others that are watching by virtue of Facebook or YouTube. Amen. We just want you to know we're going to be praying for you. And amen. Believe in God together with you. Lord Jesus, we thank you right now, God, that you truly can reveal to us areas, Lord, that would vex our souls. God, things that could draw us into the vanities of life. And we pray, God, right now that you would reveal by your spirit, hallelujah, what is attempting to bring us down and what is desiring to destroy us. Even as a nation, God, being at times led by men and women that are full of vanity. Oh, God, we pray for righteousness to exalt the nation of which we are a part. We know that sin is a reproach to any people. And so tonight, God, we take our place as priests unto you. And we ask, God, that you would save our land, heal our land. God, that you would remove far from us vanity and vexation of spirit. God, that we would be a people, Lord, that would humble ourselves and pray and seek your face. And turn from our wicked ways so that that wondrous sound of God could burst forth from heaven and you could heal our land. We pray tonight for revival to sweep across the world. We pray tonight, God, that there would be a sure moving, Lord, of, uh, of your spirit. To God, drawing backsliders back to the fold. And God, restoring families and marriages in the name of Jesus. Oh, have your way, God, we pray. We pray for Austin Sprouse tonight. We pray for Bob Bowski tonight. Uh, God Almighty, we pray for uh, James tonight and others that are watching by way, Lord, of the Internet. We pray your blessings upon them, each and every one. In the name of Jesus, those that are sick in body tonight, those, Lord, that have uh, fallen away from you in some capacity, Lord Jesus, we just pray, God, that you would do a quick work uh, of revival. Amen. In this work, in this world, we pray. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your grace for me. More than enough. More than enough. More than enough. The power of Jesus Christ Christ in me is more more than than enough. More than enough because my heart is is full full and my soul soul is free. In my weakness, you had a plan for me. for your life.
many's heart is full tonight? How many souls are free tonight? Yes, he does. He still fills heart and he still sets souls free. Praise God. Amen, 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 amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see everyone here tonight. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our youth class and our uh, friendship, fellowship class. Uh, you can go out as well. The fellowship class is going to be meeting in the fellowship hall. And I'm not sure where the youth are meeting tonight. I, but God bless each and every one of you as you exit tonight. And the remaining four of us, we're going to get into the word of the Lord. I'm glad the Rita's clan is here for the holding down this side of the church today. Love them Reedus's. Them are great people. And the Dews, Sister Jaleesa, and Sister Janice, and the Adams, and the Boudreaux's. Amen. Some of the best people in all the world wouldn't have First Apostolic Church without you folks. I hope you know that. Amen. Foundational pillar families and, and uh, Sister Bowski up here behind us. And Sister Cox, I'm glad you're here tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. We're going to look at John, John chapter number 10 tonight, and um, we're going to read the first five verses. Now, that didn't do that all service till just now. It's done it twice. But we're looking into, looking into that. St. John chapter number 10, verses 1 through 5. And um, if you have it in your Bible, um, or you're looking at the screen, just say amen. amen. Praise God. Our um, reason why we have such a large group that is out tonight, um, they are wanting to join First Apostolic Church, and uh, we do not require uh, people to be members of our church. We have a vast majority of people that come to the church that aren't members. We have about 65 members, and uh, regularly we'll have about 125. So I guess that's not a vast majority, but about half of the folks um, that come are not yet members or have chosen for whatever reason not to be members. They're supporting in various ways. But uh, we are doing a much better intentional job of making a path to membership for those that are interested. And um, the Feuersteins teach a four-part class uh, that's called Fellowship. And uh, in that class, they have two primary focuses. Number one, they want to share with them the pulse of FAC. Uh, there is a life force here. What is that pulse of FAC? And then there's a process um, uh, of how, you know, they can become uh, more closely aligned with us. And uh, we lead from this into, um, sorry about that, I had this off. Now, that wasn't me, that was you. Both of us, it's somebody's texting all of us here tonight. And uh, But there is a process called uh, uh, prayer, peace, and purpose that... Uh, uh, that that we want folks to to grow through as well, and uh, oh no, it was mine too. I had one at the same time, um, and so that's why you saw fifteen people walk out just then or whatever. And then our youth is growing. We thank God for that. Amen. Why don't we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise for what He's doing? <laughs> Amen. On our midweek service, and and brother uh, Adams, since we're kind of being lighthearted here, this is Thursday night. Uh, you wanted to thank the Lord for Wednesday night, but it's Thursday night. And uh, But uh, on our Thursday night midweek services, um, uh, there will be times where we have more breakout classes. 
And uh, so you'll come in and have a choice of, um, you know, two or three different groups that are meeting in different places. We're not really doing so much of that right now uh, until we see more of an all clear from uh, the pandemic. A lot of folks are still a little uncertain about setting in a tight classroom type of setting. Um, but um, uh, we do have some great things lined up. We want to make Thursday night uh, an exciting night. Um, and we'll still have, obviously, the, the word of the Lord going forth and Bible studies and so forth, um, pastors' studies and the like. But we do want to make it a night where people can be discipled in whatever level that they find themselves in. John chapter number 10, St. John chapter number 10, and we're going to read the first five verses of Scripture here. Amen. The word of the Lord says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door, everyone say the door. There is a door there, and this this shepherd that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Amen. And uh, I want to teach from this passage of Scripture and some more verses from uh, this chapter uh, 10 on the subject of hearing the voice of the shepherd, hearing the voice of our shepherd. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the chief shepherd of our soul, and we thank you that your voice is resounding throughout the flock. And we just ask you, Lord Jesus, continue to help us, Lord, to tune in and help us, Lord God, not to be distracted from hearing your voice in our lives daily. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. 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 The, um, the people of God, people that are called by his name, are often referred to in Scripture as a flock of sheep. We are uh, often seen uh, in that type of a representation. And then also, since we are sheep, there is in Scripture the simile of the Lord being our shepherd. And this is found throughout the entire Bible, where the Lord will speak as a shepherd to us that are of his sheepfold. David, King David, was a shepherd before he was the king. Before he was anything else, he was a shepherd. But he understood, even when he became king, that he needed himself to be shepherded. He needed it. He could not exist Without it, and he knew who that shepherd was. Psalms 23 is very familiar. We we love this chapter, and uh, we draw from it much. But verse number one just begins by saying, "The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want." Isn't it wonderful tonight to have the Lord as our shepherd? Amen. It's wonderful to have the Lord shepherding us because the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep is so very important. Amen. It's poetic at times. It's it's viewed almost in this um, uh, beautiful manner. Amen. But to know that Taking care of us is the Lord. Leading us beside still waters. Restoring our soul. Anointing our head with oil. 
On and on and on, those things that are found in that Psalms 23. The Lord looks after them that are His. I'm glad I'm a part of His flock, and I'm not going anywhere. Praise God. The prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter number 40, verses 10 and 11, had this to say. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Beautifully depicted there is the shepherd lovingly taking care of his sheep, feeding his flock, gathering the lambs, carrying them in his bosom, gently leading them when they are with young. That's Isaiah 40, verses 10 and 11. Micah, another prophet in Micah 7, 14, says unto the Lord, Feed thy people with thy rod and the flock of thine heritage which dwell solitarily in the wood, in the midst of Carmel. Let them feed in Bashan and Gilead as in the days of old. Lord, feed thy people. We are the flock of thine heritage. Amen. There are uh, many ranchers that they are very careful in how uh, they raise the sheep. Uh, they, they have particular genetic lines that they use only. They're not just going to bring in to their flock sheep from anywhere and everywhere and, and let there be this uh, crossing of genetic lines. They have a, a, a legacy line of sheep that they are, are are known for, you know, that they raise, they don't just raise any type of sheep, but they raise a particular legacy. And Micah says, we are the flock of thine heritage. We are your people. We are the ones that have been raised by you from the earliest of our times. Even before we were born, you were carrying our parents along the way. You were leading generations prior to me. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for my heritage. Amen. I'm thankful that before I was born, God was leading my parents and grandparents. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing to consider. Those of us that, uh, that are saved and, and, um, you know, there's, it's a beautiful thing to be a first generation apostolic Pentecostal, but it's, it's even precious to, to have generations before you that, that go back and, uh, uh, and you can draw from that as well to, to know, to know that God has been dealing with us for a long time. Micah said, we're your people. Ezekiel speaks about the shepherd. He, Ezekiel 34, verses 11 through 16. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I sheep seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in that cloudy and dark day, the cloudy day, the dark day caused the sheep to lose their way. The storms had scared them. The lightning had caused them to run from one another. But he says, I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them in their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture. Shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel, and I will feed my flock, and cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. 
I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and strengthen that which was sick. I will destroy the fat and the strong, but I will feed them with judgment. Praise God. Ezekiel 34 goes on, verse 22 and 23, Therefore will I save my flock. I am going to save them, and they shall no more be a prey. And I will judge between the cattle and the cattle. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my shepherd, or even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Praise God. Amen. These verses we have looked at from the prophets, Isaiah and Micah and Ezekiel, and there's many more that I could have, could have drawn from uh, tonight for this lesson. Even David in Psalms 23 is at times um, anointed in the prophetic realms. All of these describe particularly the coming Messiah who would be the great shepherd of our soul. The coming Messiah, the loving shepherd on his way. And the Bible speaks of, of the Messiah as the shepherd who would feed and gather us. He would carry us. He would lead us. He would rescue us. He would heal us. He would protect us and even judge us. All of those things are so necessary for us as sheep. Because we find ourselves hungry and we find ourselves separated and we find ourselves lame and we find ourselves unable to know where we want to go and we find ourselves lost, we find ourselves sick, we find ourselves in danger and we find ourselves sinful. But yet the shepherd of our soul is continually aware of how to meet our every need. Oh, hallelujah. It's wonderful. God is not a one-dimensional God that he can only do some things. Some people might think, well, he can only heal or he can only save. He cannot do this. He can't do that. He just does certain things. But no, friend, he does everything that is necessary to bring his flock to a safe pasture. In Ezekiel's prophecies, we see the Lord God declaring that he alone would be such a shepherd. In verse number 23, he said, I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Now, that's Ezekiel writing, but Ezekiel obviously was was ministering after David. David came before Ezekiel, and so we know that Messiah, we know that Jesus Christ, is Messiah, and we know that Jesus Christ, amen, is of the lineage of David. And so when it's speaking there of David, it's it's looking ahead to uh, Messiah. So now we come to John chapter number 10. We've just had a, a good depiction of, of the biblical um, uh, picturing of shepherding and how necessary it is and how wonderful it, it is to know who our shepherd is. But, but now, now we're at... John 10, and Jesus is giving a parable of the good shepherd. And his audience is primarily the religious leaders of Israel, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Now, there was a host of other people that were there, but he was about to make some pointed statements to these shepherds of Israel who were leading the people astray, who were not true shepherds. They were strangers. And uh, uh, he's going to call them thieves. He's going to refer to them as hirelings. He's going to make sure that it's clear in his teaching that there is one shepherd that Israel, and all of us by, uh, you know, also as well, is to be connected with. Only one shepherd. In John chapter number 10, we find four different ways that Jesus reveals himself to be a shepherd to them. Four different depictions of the shepherd. Number one, Jesus reveals himself to be the true shepherd. The true shepherd. John chapter number 10. 
Verse number one, verily, verily, I say unto you. Now, verily, verily can mean truly, truly. I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Amen. The sheepfold here. It was the holding pen, if you please, um, possibly in the center of town, a place where many shepherds would allow their sheep who have been brought into the city to be stored overnight. Uh, they would provide necessary food and water for them, but it was a place where multiple flocks would, would come together. And um, they would have a watchman, a porter, that would be responsible for the door. Walls would be surrounding um, these sheep and um, some kind of fencing. And it would be quite high so that the sheep would not some way or another be startled and jump over it. And um, if there ever was seen an individual that was climbing up over the wall and not attempting to just come and be welcomed to come through the gate, that would truly be someone that had ill intentions. If you're going to climb over the wall and not try to be seen by the porter, you obviously are a thief. You are, you are coming in to, to rob. And, and, and Jesus is is saying there is a door, there is an entrance that the true shepherd is not afraid to come through. He's not worried about being turned away by the porter because he knows who he is and the porter recognizes him and the sheep are going to recognize him as well. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus said, I have come to you through the door. I didn't come to you climbing over a wall. I didn't come sneaking in to try to pull people together and somehow take from others a flock. He said, I have come through the door. Now, this is a, a, a testament of him understanding, of course, who he is, and them who should have known who he was, that they weren't truly acknowledging that he, Jesus, was the Messiah. I mean, he was revealing it in many different ways, signs, wonders, miracles, his teaching, and so forth. All of those things testified that this was a powerful you know, uh, uh, um, this, was, this was God manifest in flesh. The Messiah was expected. They were anticipating Messiah. And Scripture reveals many ways that they would recognize who the true Messiah was. The evidence was already given. Prophets of old had written it out. They had studied it. It was available to whosoever would want to look into it. And, and the door, that this entrance, this would be the proper manner for the shepherd that we read from the prophets previously who was going to come. This would be the right way. Jesus, Jesus would come the right way. Jesus is going to, to, to do it the right way. And, and so he fulfilled all the prophecies of old concerning Messiah. For instance, and there's 48 or so of them, uh, and oftentimes at Christmas we will talk about how Jesus fulfilled the various, uh, all of the prophecies that had been given concerning who Messiah was going to be. But Isaiah had said the virgin is going to conceive. We, had, we had knew he was going to be born in Bethlehem. We knew he was going to be born into the family of David. Amen. We, 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 we had all of these things, and, and those, those right there are enough for anyone to say, oh, so... Mary said that he was conceived in her womb by an act of God and he was truly born in Bethlehem. And, and when you look at, at who his mother is and the family line through 
through Joseph. He's, he's born legally into the family of David. That right there is enough. But on and on and on, so many other things he did uh, and to testify of the fact that he was Messiah. Not only did Jesus enter through the proper door, but he becomes the door as well. It's interesting. You see that in John chapter number 10 and verse number 7. Jesus said unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. The sheep are going to come in and go out through me. He said, I become the door. I have come through the door properly, but I am now the door itself. Praise God. So Jesus is the true shepherd. He is the one that was spoken of that would come, and they ought to have been welcoming of him, anticipating him, but instead... They were uh, at odds with him. And Jesus is, is, is declaring to these religious leaders, you aren't willing to step aside. You aren't willing to, 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 to lose your hold. You aren't really wanting Messiah. You want, if you want Messiah, you want a Messiah that you can control. You, you can direct. You want Messiah to line up completely with you. But Messiah is not going to be a thief. Messiah is not going to be a robber. Messiah is not going to side with you. What you are doing is wrong, Jesus is saying. Amen. There's a true shepherd and there's a false shepherd. The second thing we find is Jesus declares he's the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd of John chapter number 10. And verses 10 and 11, the thief, he speaks, cometh not but for to steal to kill, and to destroy. Now, sheep are, uh, they are, they are um, trusting of their shepherds, but they are not so trusting of other people. They, they do not uh, easily take to new people. And if there's anything out of the ordinary in their sheepfold, they, it, it scares them. It, it, it frightens them because they, uh, they're, they're not expecting it or, or looking at it. And so they, they are aware of the fact that there is a, a, a thief that's coming to kill and steal and destroy. They are already, they are already sensing instinctively that something isn't right about these that would climb over the wall. But the religious leaders are not, they're not worried about that because they have been fleecing the flock for so long. They have been taking what they wanted and getting their way for so long. They don't realize that they are hindering, that they are literally destroying Israel. Jesus is telling them, you are stealing, killing, and destroying people. You, you are destroying God's flock. But he said, I am come that they might have life. Amen. Again, a good shepherd. A good, a good shepherd is there to, to, to feed and, and to, to lead them by the still waters and, and, and to anoint their head with oil and to take care of their needs. He said, I'm coming to make sure that their needs are met. Amen. Like Brother Matthew talked about, he's going to meet our needs, even if that's not always the way that we thought he was going to do it. He said, I've come to meet your needs. I've come to give you life. I've come that you might have it more abundantly. And then he goes on, verse number 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. I'm wanting to give you life, and I'm wanting to give my life for you. Now, the prophet Isaiah would describe the Messiah as the suffering Savior in Isaiah 53, verses 6 through 8. And I'm jumping ahead uh, five verses to get to these. There's other things that was said in the first five verses. But verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. Amen. It's it's natural thing for, for sheep to, to get lost, to stray. We have turned everyone to our own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so openeth not his mouth. 
He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. He was cut off from the land of the living. He was murdered. And all of this happened because he was stricken for the transgressions of the people. Because we went astray, Jesus had to die. That's what happened. Amen. Because we went astray, the shepherd had to go seeking us. And for the shepherd to be able to properly uh, get us returned, he had to die for us. Amen. He's the good shepherd, willing to lay down his life for the sheep, as opposed to the false shepherds who would not give a nickel for the sheep. They're not willing to, to, to do anything except take from they're not, they, 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 they have been, uh, they've been able to, uh, to steal, kill, and destroy for so long that taking care of the flock is not what they're interested in at all. But Jesus said, I'm going to lay down my life for the sheep, which as we see from Isaiah there, this would happen not too long after he tells these leaders. And these leaders would be the one that would conspire with others and eventually cause him to be crucified. So he is also the good shepherd. Number three, Jesus is the one shepherd. Amen. The one shepherd. While there might be others that come along at various times, they weren't the one shepherd. David was a shepherd. Moses was a shepherd. Various people in the Old Testament was considered as shepherds over Israel, but there was the one shepherd that all of them would have said, I'm not he, I'm not the one. John chapter number 10 and verse number 12, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. Amen. The hirelings, these were those that were doing it only for the money. These aren't the one shepherd, but these are, these, these are subcontracted shepherds, if you please. The sheep don't belong to them, and once they begin to realize danger is on the way, they leave. They're, they're, they flee. And the wolf cometh and begins to snatch the sheep and not only catch them, but when a wolf or some kind of a predatory beast gets into a flock of sheep, their desire is not just for one meal, but their desire is for multiple meals. And if they can scatter the sheep, they can just go pick them up one by one. They can get them whenever they're hungry. They, they don't have that, that safety of being together. And the Lord said that these hirelings see the wolf coming and they flee. Verse 16, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. One shepherd. One fold and one shepherd. Now, the Old Testament prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel 34, verse number 23 says, And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Again, I already said, David was prior to Ezekiel. And so when Ezekiel is prophesying this, he is speaking of the lineage of David, he that would come, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. One shepherd over them that will feed them. Amen. You and I can look upon this tonight and realize that we cannot go chasing everything and everybody. Amen. We have to be careful that we are hearing the voice of the shepherd, that we are in tune with God. Amen. More than we've ever been in tune with God before. If we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need Him now. Amen. And uh, in, in these troublesome times that we are in, we can be deceived 
And we can uh, be led astray by false shepherds. The Lord said, I'm going to be your shepherd. I'm going to be with you all the way to the end. He is the one shepherd. Uh, these religious leaders didn't want to hear that. They didn't want the others to hear that. They wanted to, they wanted to keep this information uh, away from the people. They, they hoped that nobody was reading Ezekiel because then they would know that they needed to continually anticipate this one shepherd that was to come who would be of the lineage of David. And all of this would continually point to Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Finally, in verse number, uh, I mean, the fourth way, we find Jesus in John 10, 17, and 18, is he is the obedient shepherd. The obedient shepherd. He said, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Amen. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and have power to take it up again. Amen. This commandment have I received of my Father. We realize that Jesus was God manifest in the flesh, that Jesus was coming to earth with a particular purpose, directive. Amen. Uh, from from the, uh, the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. But Jesus was also not only Son of God, He was Son of Man. And the Bible lets us know in Hebrews chapter number 5, verses 7 and 8, that He struggled in the days of His flesh. Jesus had flesh. He had bone. He had blood to spill. Who in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears unto Him that was able to save Him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. All right? He was the son of God and son of man. As son of man in his flesh, he would pray, need things. Amen. He, he, had, to, he had to continually bend the flesh to the purpose for which he had come. His flesh didn't want to die. His, he, in the garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it be thou, let this cup pass from me. If there's some other manner with which we can do this, in this hour, in that final moments prior to the rest and crucifixion, he goes on to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus had sufferings. And sufferings taught him things. Sufferings kept him grounded, if you please. Sufferings helped him to truly identify with you and I. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. But he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He experienced all that you and I have experienced. Amen. Pain in his body, anguish in his soul. Amen. He, he went through so many things so that he could understand and know us. Amen. But just as there is often a purification that happens in suffering so often, so, so to the same, uh, the Bible speaks of him learning obedience. We see another depiction of Christ um, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He was God, but when he came to this earth, he didn't go around telling everybody. He didn't take upon himself um, that which was duly his as being one in the form of God. He could have claimed equality with God while he was the uh, man Christ Jesus. 
But he took rather upon himself the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now earlier we read where he said, I have power to lay my life down, and I have power to take it up again. And here we see it says he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. He humbled himself. That was the only way death was going to be able to get a hold of him. He had to submit to death. Death couldn't steal life from the Lord. But he humbled himself. He became obedient unto this death, unto the plan of death, even the death as cruel as the death of the cross. And so uh, we, we see the obedience on display of our Savior. So our text tonight, John 10, 1 through 5, we've just looked at it from the perspective of the type of, of shepherd that uh, Jesus is, true and false shepherds. Now, I want to look at it for just a, a few moments from the vantage point of the sheep, the vantage point of, uh, of you and I. Amen. The Bible says there, and, and uh, we won't read it again, but in verse number three, um, Jesus is the shepherd. He comes through the door. To him the porter openeth, the watchman. The watchman, the porter, recognizes who he is. Jesus is declaring there that you don't see me, but there are some that see me. You don't realize who I am, but others are opening up to me. They're opening their heart to me. They're being receptive to me. The true believer, amen, is, is, is being receptive to the Lord. But these false are keeping him at bay. But just having an open door is not all that is necessary to convince the sheep to move. You can, you can go to a sheepfold and open the gate, and they'll just sit there and look at that open gate. They, they, they're not just anticipating running out of that gate on their own. If they are, you know, a, a, a legacy flock that's trained to the voice of the shepherd or to the routines of the shepherd, that gate being open is not the full temptation that it might be for some kind of other animal that uh, is, is, is wanting to escape. There's other things that are necessary to convince the sheep to move and we find that the sheep must hear and know the voice of the shepherd. They must hear and know the voice of the shepherd. In verse number 3, the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Praise God. The sheep hear his voice. God does speak to his flock. God speaks to his flock. Amen. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, this um, is, is looking at a particular type of sheepfold, and this would have been one where many flocks were together in this temporary holding pen. And when the shepherds would come to remove their flock, they would cry out, and they would have maybe a particular call that they often used, a sound that they made, maybe a whistle or whatever it was, that was uh, used every time. And those sheep were, were familiar with that. They would not respond to the voice of another shepherd that was unfamiliar to them because, again, they, they are hesitant. They are fearful creatures. Amen. But God speaks to his flock. Now, in this particular instance, there is all the sheep in the fold hearing the shepherd's voice. But sadly, not all of the sheep in the fold recognize the voice you know, because he's not their shepherd. He's not their shepherd. Amen. There can be, sadly, uh, people in the church that haven't allowed the Lord to truly be their shepherd. And they hear what you hear, but they don't hear it with the same recognition. Amen. Now, the first part that I want to bring out about this is that the voice of the shepherd 
is speaking to all of the sheep. God will speak to his entire flock corporately at times. His word to all is going to be good for all. Now, in a moment, we're going to see that the shepherd knows the names of the sheep individually. He has named them individually. He is personally related to them individually, but we're not, we're not going to, to look at that for, but for a moment uh, next. It's important for us to realize that even though the Lord does speak personally at times to us, we should pay as much attention for when he speaks corporately to us all. Amen. If only we are anticipating, well, he'll come talk to me personally about something. Then we will miss out on a lot of the truths that God has already given to the church. Amen. God doesn't have to give you an individual message when he has already given a uniform uniform message, a corporate message to everybody. He doesn't have to say, now I know I told the whole church this, but I wanted to make sure you understood it and I'm going to drive it home personally to you. There are some times where some people say, I know that the whole church has read this, studied this, heard this, but I don't have a personal conviction about it. Or I don't think I need to worry about it myself until I hear from God. Well, why would God have to give you always a special message? Amen. Some people are always seeking personal revelation. They're always wanting some private manna. They have this mentality maybe that they're a little bit more mature than the other saints. And so God God tells them things on a different level than he tells everybody else. Beware, 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 beware of the pride that is at work in your heart. When you can sit through a message and think that that message was for the person down the pew and not for you. We're willing to you know, just allow it to go to everybody else, but we don't think we need to hear that. If God is speaking, I want to have an ear to hear. Amen. Even if I feel like I heard it before. Amen. Amen. Even if it seems like that's something that, you know, I, I've been taught all my life. When God is speaking to the entire church, He is wanting this to be heard by everybody. And you know what? There's, it's good to hear things over and over and over again. It's good. It's good to hear it again. Amen. Drives the point even deeper within us. We, we have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful thing. But at the same time, He's called us into the body. He's made us a part of, uh, of His church. And there's an individualistic mentality that often is found here in the West where we believe that, you know, uh, we deserve to have this, this, this personal touch, this personal attention. We're used to being catered to. And we want God to cater to us. God help us. If that was the case, in the time of the uh, passing out of Egypt, there wouldn't have been everybody that made it that made it. Paul writes of this in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. I've never looked at it from the perspective that I looked at it when I was putting this sermon together. Paul said, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. That rock was Christ. Paul is saying, All our fathers heard this and acted accordingly. All of them passed through the sea because they were willing to go along with Moses there. They weren't sitting around saying, okay, you all go through that parted water. He's going to carry me in a chariot and take me over. I'm going to have this heavenly, heavenly transportation. No, no, no. This was how it was done. We better be in tune with what God is saying and speaking because He's not going to make a 
different path for each individual. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's one message. Amen. We, we better not just buy into this idea that, that there's going to be, you know, God's going to make a separate way for each individual. All, all paths are going to lead to the same destination. Because he loves everybody, he's going to let you go that way and you go that way and you go that way. He didn't do it then. He didn't make a lot of different ways through the Red Sea. There was one way through the Red Sea. Amen. They were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. All ate the same spiritual meat. If you were going to eat, you were going to eat the manna. Right? If you were going to eat, you were going to eat manna. If you were going to drink, you were going to drink the water that came from the rock. Because the Lord was training them that they were to be united in Him and that He would supply their need. He was forming them into that flock. And if we're not careful, sometimes we can become people that feel like us and God have our own thing going and we don't need to be with everybody else and we don't need what other people need. And we don't realize how hungry we're getting and how thirsty we're getting and everybody else is full. God help us. Amen. And so they were, they were all taken care of in the same way. If, we didn't go, if you didn't go along with the rest, you didn't get delivered. You didn't receive anything. We should never minimize the voice of God when He speaks to everybody, the whole flock. Amen. Amen. God may give a, a certain sermon. God, God may send a certain word that, that you just didn't really feel like that sermon was for you or that, that word was for you. Well, maybe you need to take another look at that. Look at it a little more deeply. Maybe you were deafened and blinded by some of your own spiritual pride and you didn't hear what God wanted you to hear. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Does God have to write another Bible for us? No. No. And those that feel like they had to have a, another Bible than that which was given, they have to have their hand delivered by some angel? That's, a, that's it's not, the, not, not what I want to follow after. Amen. So he, he speaks to us corporately. He also, however, though, does know us. He knows us individually. He calls us, verse number three, each of his sheep by name. So even though God sees all of us, he does see you. He does know you. He and looks at you and I. Amen. He sees the various concerns that we have. He sees the injuries that we are carrying. He knows our personality temperaments. He realizes that, that, uh, uh, that there are times in which, you know, we need Him. We need a personal touch from Him. Amen. Psalms 139 Verses 1 through 5, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. God, You're fully aware of me. Me. You, you see all of us, but You're also fully aware of me. You know. You know when I'm sitting down. You know when I'm rising up. You know my thoughts even. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there's not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid Thy hand upon me. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I'm glad to be a part of the church of the living God corporately, but I'm also glad that I have a personal relationship with God. I'm glad I hear Him call my name. Amen. I'm glad that I have an identification with Him. Oh, hallelujah. He calleth His own sheep by 
name and leadeth them out. All right? So we have the voice of the shepherd to the whole flock. We have the voice of the shepherd to the individual sheep who he has named, who he has cared for individually. And he gives us a voice where he calls us out, where he calls us to follow him, where he calls us to do something that maybe not everybody else he's calling to do. There are some things that that God will ask of you that he won't ask of me. There's some some opportunities or, or whatever that others may have or some suffering that others may go through. Or there, there's some burdens that others may have to bear. But God has called them. God has spoken to them and led them out. Amen. He's leading us out. He doesn't want us to remain um, there in that sheepfold. He's, he's wanting to make sure that we follow him out. Amen. Praise God. Verse number 16. And other sheep, he said, I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and, and one shepherd. So what is the voice of the shepherd to them? This is a voice that unites them. We need the voice of God to, to know how to be united properly with other people. Amen. We need to hear God speaking to us about how we can gather properly with, with other people. Jesus said, I've got other sheep that they're not of this fold. They're, they're not exactly in, in this legacy line. But he said, I'm going to bring them as well, and they hear my voice also. That which unites us together with people, amen, is are we hearing the voice of God? Are we hearing him speak to us? And are we allowing him to be that one shepherd? And see, uniting us together, it's the desire of God to unite us together. Hallelujah. Disunity within any church or with any flock of sheep is a, is a destructive thing. I was reading a book today about a shepherd that had a flock of sheep and one particular uh, uh, ewe uh, would, would, would go to the fence and, and would, would, would bump against the fence and try to dig around the fence. And uh, uh, this this particular uh, uh, sheep was 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 always kind of its temperament was was a troublemaker, and um, uh, and it was training some of the littler sheep to do what it was doing, and so the uh, the individual that was talking to this shepherd he said, well, what how did you how did you change that? And he said, well, he said, lamb chops. That particular sheep had to become lamb chops because of its contagious manner. It was, it was, it was causing a rebelliousness to come within the flock. And so the, it had, there was only one option there. We need to be united together. We need to be united to the shepherd's voice. If we aren't united together to the shepherd's voice and forming into one fold, and I thank God for the great unity here at First Apostolic Church of Steger, but if something could come in and, and tempt us to break apart from one another, we need to be very careful that we don't allow personality conflicts and, and, and differences of opinions and so forth to divide us. That's not the work of the shepherd. That's the work of our own prideful heart or the thief that's coming to steal, kill, and destroy. Don't let anything divide you from your brother or your sister. When we're all hearing his voice, we're going to hear him say, stay together, be united. That's what he's going to say. He's not going to say, hate this one, divide yourself from that one. This person and that person is not worthy of your friendship and love. No, he's calling us out so that we could be united together. The next voice we hear of the shepherd is found in Matthew chapter number 18, verses 12 and 13. How thank ye, 
If a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth to the mountains and seeketh that which was astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than the ninety and nine which went not astray. That sound, that rejoicing of the shepherd. Oh, what a wonderful sound that is for that, that lost sheep to hear its name being called. All we have gone astray like sheep. All of us. And he's came looking for us. He's come calling for us. Amen. He rescued us. Praise God. And the voice of the shepherd is one of rejoicing. God rejoices over the sinner that comes to repentance. God rejoiceth over the backslider that has strayed, that is found and returns to the fold. And we should rejoice with our shepherd as well. Amen. We should rejoice together. We're part of the 90 and 9 that did not go astray, but our attitude ought to be of that joy as well. We see the shepherd caring enough for that one sheep. He's got 90 and 9, but that one that's lost, he leaves the rest of them in the fold and he goes looking for them. Oh, praise God. What a, a depiction of the love of God that he's not going to let economics get in the way. He's not going to say, well, I got, I got all of them but one, and that's, oh, praise God. Amen. Amen. Finally, we see depiction of the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5 and 4. And he's got a voice. Amen. It's a voice that calls us heavenward. And when that chief shepherd, shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Hallelujah. He's going to appear. The chief shepherd is going to appear. He's coming back for his flock. He's coming back for a people whose ear is tuned to his cry. The Bible says that the last trump, the shout of the archangel, the voice of the archangel, the voice is going to be heard. Amen. We're going to hear that sound of that trumpet. Praise God. Amen. If our ears are tuned properly, the same, amen, the same way that we hear his voice, we're going to hear that trumpet sound. And we're going to know, we know that he is coming for us, ready, amen, to take us to that final fold in the sky. Praise God. Amen. So we need to be, we need to be a people. We need to be a people, amen, that have our ears tuned to him. The sheep hear his voice. He speaks to all of us. He speaks to us individually as well. He speaks with a voice to call us out to follow Him. He speaks with a voice to call us to be united. Forever He is calling for that. Amen. He speaks with a voice of rejoicing over us. And He speaks with a voice of calling us heavenward. Praise God. That's our shepherd tonight. He is the true shepherd. He is the good shepherd. Oh, hallelujah. He is, amen, the obedient shepherd. He is the one shepherd. There's not any other that we need to be looking for. Amen. We don't need to be distracted by those that are trying to climb up over the wall. In these last days, there's going to be a lot of people that are making a big deal about themselves. But if we know who he is, like never before, we need to be in tune with him, in tune with his voice, aware of what he's speaking. There's going to be a lot of sounds that happen, a lot of voices that cry out. But, oh, hallelujah, this is a, not the day to be uncertain. If there's an uncertain recognition of His voice, if you're not sure that you're hearing from God, if you're not sure that you know His voice when He calls into you, that's I'm telling you tonight, as we stand together, you need to just seek after God with all that you have. You need to call upon His name with all that is within you. Amen. You need to allow nothing, nothing to separate you from Him. Oh, God, we thank You tonight. We thank You that You are the true shepherd. We thank You tonight that You are the good shepherd. We thank You tonight that You are that one shepherd. We thank You tonight that You are the obedient shepherd. We thank You tonight that You speak to Your sheep corporately. We thank You tonight that You speak to us individually. Oh, hallelujah. We thank You tonight that You call us out 
so that we can follow you. And Lord, we want to follow you. Where do you want us to be led to, God? Lead us, shepherd of our soul. Lead us and guide us. Direct us. Oh, God, we don't want to remain behind when it's time to go. We don't want to be left behind, God. We want to come out, come out and follow you as you take us, Lord, where it is that you would have us to go. Amen. We want to follow that voice that brings us even to other places and does lead us, God, to other people as well that unites us together with other folds, God. Amen. And, and we want to, Lord, rejoice with you as sinners are brought to salvation, as backsliders are returning to the fold. My God in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for that final, final voice that we're going to hear Amen. When you call us from this, this earth to that heavenly place, oh, hallelujah. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. We thank you tonight. We thank you tonight. We glory in you tonight, God, heavenly Father, chief shepherd of our souls. We give you praise and honor and glory. Lord, let somebody, let somebody hear your voice that hasn't heard it in a long time. Let somebody that's drawing cold, God. Let somebody that's that 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 is Lord that is lost tonight, backslidden tonight. Let somebody hear it. Let somebody hear it, God. We've got friends, we've got family, we've got neighbors, oh God. We got people in our workplaces, Lord. Hallelujah. That they do not know that your voice is calling to them. They don't hear it for whatever reason, or they're turning away from it, God. God Almighty, help us, help us to be a people, Lord, that tell others that God has a call for them as well. Jesus, in your name, God, bless us now. Bless us as a congregation, God. Bless all of our children, God, that have been in our junior youth class tonight. Thank you for them, Lord. Bless all of our young people, God, that have been in the youth class. Bless all of the folks that have been, Lord, in our fellowship class tonight. And bless all of these that have been in the pastor's class. God, just continue to unite us as a church. This church is growing. It's prospering. We thank you for it, God. Lord, we, we've been through so many years where we didn't grow, we didn't prosper. But now you are leading us into a new dimension, a new place. And we all want to go together. We want to all hear your voice together. Oh, hallelujah. No matter how long we've been apart, God. Oh, how long we've been a member, God. Lord, we, we, we can't sit on our laurels. We must go forward in faith, hearing your voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you for being here tonight. I pray that the word of the Lord was spoken and you heard it. And uh, we'll see you back in the house of the Lord, Lord willing, on Sunday.